All right, guys. I think we might be live. If not, I'm talking to nobody besides the man of the hour here today being Richard Swan, who is a special, special guest because he has written some of my favorite books so far that I've read, being the Empire of the Wolf series with book number three being the book I am reading right now, The Trials oh, of the Empire. Oh, my Look, God. You get the same book? book? Yeah, yeah. I, they sent me like two box fulls of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> As you can see. Can't move I'm, for them. I'm this this far into it so far. So I just started my journey like a couple of days uh, okay. ago. Oh, that's I was wondering if that was the beginning or the end. Okay, so you're in the initial uh, phases. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. How are you yes, finding so, it so far? So far, okay. Hate it. Hate it. <laughs> I'm enjoying it so far. It's just a character came out out of nowhere that I was not expecting to read about no. again. I was like, yeah, yeah. wait a second, this <laughs> person again? <laughs> <laughs> I've had uh, one person be like. Just remind me who this is. <laughs> it's like, oh, dude, there's, there's recaps on the website. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I remember this character mm. in particular because it was my one of my favorite scenes from book number one. Because, like, right. I don't know if you did this on purpose or not, but in terms mm. of, like, subverting my expectations of these arcane like, mm. powers. So I, when I yes. first read it, I was like, ooh, this is mystic mask re you know, raising from the ground. Yeah, and then, yeah. you know what? It's being pulled by a... A little mm. pulley system. I was like, a thread. Oh, mm. okay. Yeah, but why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that was one of my uh, my sort of you know shocking, uh, not shocking, but you know one of the twists in the book. Anyway, I thought it's always fun to do a, throw a few curveballs in their early doors. Now you did a good job because, like, at first I was like, "Ooh, we already got some magic right off the bat," and then mm. it's like, "Oh, wait." Hmm, that's just a person playing magic tricks here. Yeah, no. Well, book three is is heavy on the magic, actually. Um, I uh, There's a lot of it in, a lot of magic in the third book. Mm. Uh, it's there all, you know, I mean, uh, the first book was pretty light on it, um, but I kind of was sowing the seeds for uh, more of an investigation <laughs> into the afterlife. And then the second book obviously had the Mufram in it, which was the, um, you know, the demonic hex. And then, you know, the third book really is a lot, there's a lot of... Uh, demonic realm uh in it which which i, I mean i loved writing it um i mean i was really heavily inspired by uh wayne barlow uh barlow's inferno which is an old um uh it's an old but like an art book from like the 80s or 90s and they go for thousands of pounds now on ebay because it's been out of print for ages oh, and then yeah. about oh let's say two years ago um he linked up with a publisher in china i think and they did like a reissue oh it, it was a it was called psychopomp and it was um a collection of lots of his old art hell artwork um plus some new stuff and i immediately uh purchased a copy and it's a wonderful <laughs> it's all you know it's like beelzebub and it's like um i think there's an image of satan but there's it's it's like his imaginings of your sort of classic christian medieval hell like dante's mm -hmm. inferno um but yeah and you get this kind of ash wastes and you get like this these the cities of hell and what they might look like and you know the the, the, the war gate which is a kind of like a massive commemorative archway and they've got this demonic procession marching through it and i love that i mean it's creepy as fuck but it, i it it's so <laughs> inspiring and it was a huge inspiration on me many years ago and so you know things like that and then like the old and original um this is going to sound weird but the first quake game um Ooh, which, i love quake from id software I, I that was the first game i ever played on my dad's um pc and that just kind of again that sort of demonic feel that liminal aesthetic because it's and it, the because the space is um because it's uh because it's an old game and so lots of it the skybox is just massive and you can kind of clip out it through walls and stuff and you get this sense <laughs> of sort of suspension and liminality and i i love trying to capture that aesthetic so um i yeah so that was so i really i was just like you know what i'm just gonna go for it this fucking people probably won't like it as much but I, but i'm writing the book that i want to write um so there it is i mean that's the, the great thing about being an author right you write what you want to write that's it yeah yeah but the game that came like the first one of my first games was quake 2 when i was playing right. on my parents computer yes. and i could i remember distinctly hearing the dial-up tone as it wound up turning on this computer mm. like it was that long ago i don't even think yeah, i played yeah. online i just remember i just remember that sound for whatever right. reason in my parents yeah, bedroom yeah. My i had quake, quake 2. 2 it was it was one of the it was one of the first games i got for the place the, the playstation 
I, I had moved on to consoles when I was about nine, 10 or so, I think, and quaked. I got Resident Evil, which I was too frightened to play. So I, part, <laughs> I got about five minutes in and I was like, that's too much, that's too rich for my blood. Um, and then I went back to Spyro the Dragon. That was more my speed. Oh, yeah, um, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 loved it. Less uh, medieval, a little less, less yeah, yeah, uh, a little less. Dante brutal. Inferno, did that? Uh, Dante's Inferno, did that like help inspire your kind of medieval demonic world that you wrote in the, this series? Because it's a uh, very immersive and uh, very visual. It is. It's um. I mean, I mean, yes. Like you know, the works of sort of um Christopher Marlowe, Doctor Faustus, um Dante, of course, um. Wayne Barlow's Hell on Art, um, Art on Hell was the was the big driver. Um, I guess even stuff like Quake and Doom as well. I mm-hmm. I love the idea of um, an actual tangible sequence of astral planes that had actual demonic creatures and actual angelic. You know, there's angels as well. Um, it being a real place and how a mortal <laughs> society would kind of grapple with knowing that. But of course the, the knowledge is not widely shared for obvious reasons uh, within the empire of the wolf. Um, so people are kind of praying to it and, and, you know, all these demons and gods are kind of worshiping them and mm-hmm. all these demons and gods are totally apathetic to them. Um, so I, I loved the kind of the thought behind what do you do if the afterlife is re is real and you know, you're going to go there um how do you kind of grapple with that and that's some some religious themes that i explore in the third book um with von Ostelin, who's a templar and is, is a kind of you know uh uh religious very religious kind of cult-like um mm-hmm. neiman warrior and has to kind of grapple with the fact that the afterlife is just full of terrifying nonsensical <laughs> horrors <laughs> um, and it's like this is what i've been praying to <laughs> you know for like the last 40 years um so that was quite fun to, to grab have with. you have you read evan winter's rage of dragons before? no he's another he's another orbit author isn't he um, i am ha- i haven't but i've seen it's very highly regarded yeah there's like another plane kind of similar to what's in your book in terms of this crazy insane looking demonic creatures that will just tear you to shreds when you enter right. this plane Lovely. i was like this kind of feels a little bit similar but yeah. uh a, a little bit different at the same time because the main character in that book he's going there for a different reason than what's right. going on in your book mm. but oh it's a yeah i mean it's a well-trodden path I, it's um I, the answer is i haven't re- i haven't read it no and uh I, but it but it looks very good um mm-hmm. i don't think there's anything super unique about you know and uh, having a real afterlife and you know not sort of laying claim yeah. to having invented the, the concept <laughs> of it. um but uh you know just kind of as as you can only ever do as an author uh you know you're, you're putting your own stamp on a lifetime of influences um and uh, you know rarely do we re- you know, reinvent the wheel um so i wouldn't be surprised if there were you know dozens of novels which had so you know d- demonic kind of um goings mm-hmm. on um but you you just sort of funnel it through your own lens and your own aesthetic don't you i also saw yesterday or what maybe for you it was like today i don't with these time zones <laughs> man it's kind of crazy but <laughs> i'm you're ahead with, of you uh, <laughs> you're with a uh, jay christoph who yes. also wrote one of my favorite books which i have right here empire of the is vampire that the, is that the color version that i can see it is yes yeah yeah lovely mm-hmm. uh, it's a great book isn't it so how like did you just end up being with him because he was near you or like how did that wind up where you were talking with him about oh, empire of the damned i know i know jay um from a couple of years ago we met at a um there's a comic con in australia called uh, supernova mm. and uh he was uh he was at that the empire uh so justice of kings came out in the same year as empire of the vampire uh, oh, and so okay. we were we were both guests at that comic con and um yeah so we got you know we got to chatting and we got on well and we've met up for drinks and, and stuff since then so so jay's a you know friend of mine and um he was here a few weeks ago and asked me if i wanted to MC his um his book launch <laughs> for empire of the damned and i said oh, yeah, i'm delighted to obviously so, <laughs> um we did two nights in sydney um the last night and the night before and uh, it was it was wonderful you know we were just kind of you know, bantering and talking about the the book and i mm-hmm. had to i had been delaying reading empire of the vampire because it's a big old book 
It's huge. Um, yeah. 700 pages or something. And I, I'm a very slow reader. So I was like, oh, I'm, I'll put this off. And then obviously he asked me to do that. So I thought, well, I definitely have to read it now. So I was like reading it. I was in hospital. I was reading it. And then I had to, I was listening to the audio book as well. So when I couldn't read, I was listening. And when I was couldn't listen, I was reading and I was just plowing through this thing. So I did read the whole thing in about two <laughs> weeks, which is unheard of for me. But, uh, but luckily I, I, thought it was a fantastic novel um mm -hmm. and so it wasn't a chore at all it was it was a real pleasure um but yeah that's what i was doing yeah that was a definitely a two-week sprint for you then to get through that massive chunky book yeah but i thought yeah. it was funny how like his event was like at a huge looking church thing i felt yeah like the was... second night was at a church yeah <laughs> we, were, we were laughing someone was sort of combust in the uh <laughs> in the transept but everybody was fine we were on holy ground <laughs> So I did see mm. when I was looking at your name here on Goodreads, because like I know you obviously from Empire of the Wolf series. Yeah. And yeah, everywhere I saw when I first saw the Justice of the Kings come out, I kept seeing debut author, debut author, Justice of Kings. Look at this debut mm -hmm. author here. And when I'm looking at you up on Goodreads, I see you have like 12 sure. books underneath your your <laughs> umbrella. I was like, wait that a minute. No, no. Oh, books? Not What's going on I'm here? Is it that many? I've got well. There's a couple of those are a short story ma in magazines, right? So a couple okay. of those would be Grim Dark uh, magazine. I did a couple of shorts of them, and one is a uh, short for Black Library. So I think at least three of those are short stories I've done since Justice of Kings. Um, but what the the main body of work, uh, <laughs> if, I, if it can be so called, um, <laughs> is uh, I self published a trilogy of science fiction novels about. Oh, going on like eight or nine years ago now uh the first one came out and um it was because it was uh because it had been because that had been self-published so long ago and um because it was sci-fi and because it was as, as you know, self-published um i think the feeling was that it kind of didn't count you know so to speak um and they preferred and also because i hadn't written fantasy and this was my kind of you know big imprint mm -hmm. um you know appearance on on this on the on the world stage of <laughs> fantasy rising um they uh, just it's just a marketing thing it's all it is um i don't think a, a tremendous amount of thought went into it to be honest um and uh there was no it was never in prospect that, that that those old works would kind of be revisited or mm -hmm. you know, brought, brought to anybody's attention. Uh, yeah, but no. But I've been right. You know, I did like three novels, I think, and then I did a prequel not novel, and then I cut two two um, spin off kind of novellas as well. So yeah, it looks like it's this huge corpus of work, but really it was about eight, <laughs> it was about eighteen months worth of actual um, <laughs> writing, sort of nearly ten years ago. I'm very intrigued because I'm a huge fan of sci-fi and like work that you've done here in the Empire of the Wolf series. I absolutely mm. love. Oh, so thanks. I'm very interested in uh, the direction you take sci-fi. If it's any different, do we have any uh, traveling lawyers in that book too? No, it's no, no, not at all, but it's got, but it's interesting. It's, I was uh, really heavily influenced. I was growing up with, um, I was growing up with, uh, the war on terror happening you know so 9 11 happened when i was about 12 i think mm -hmm. and um the next sort of 10 years was all you know war on terror war on terror war on terror and i had all of this um and then i did my degree i did a law degree and and as part of that degree i did things like you know counterterrorism and i did you know, the, the law of counterterrorism obviously and uh, the law and ethics of warfare and stuff like that so i was so she's totally saturated with this kind of and, and public international law so you know full of these ideas and i and it was against that background that i wrote the art of war trilogy which is the name of that sci-fi trilogy um so it's mm -hmm. very uh political it's very diplomatic it's very espionage it's very extraordinary rendition so it's a kind Ooh. of oh yeah i what i wanted to do was take like an event and explore it from like probably slightly too many povs <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, you know you, it's, you learn these things the longer you write i think um I, I actually revisited the novel i revisited the novels recently for reasons that i can't talk about at the moment um and uh so i gave them a fresh coat of you know paint especially the first one needed quite a lot of work mm -hmm. went through the first one and I did, mostly deleting stuff actually it was just a bit overwritten um so i you know took about twenty thousand words out of it um oh wow twenty thousand out 
yeah yeah so it's actually it's quite not short i mean it was about 140 and that's about 120 um and uh yeah so it's but what i but it's sort of structured in such a way that it's like one pov the next pov the next PV. so the first five chapters are all different povs which okay. is def which is a bit of a no-no these like it's not a great way to structure a novel normally if i'm doing multiple pov novels um mm -hmm. i would i would do like one two one two one three for example you know you give the reader a chance to kind of get accustomed to a couple of characters before you move on um so i but but you know but having said all of that though i think i think the story was there the narrative was there you know I, I tweaked a little bit of dialogue but i was still really happy with it so um apart from like removing a lot of the redundancy in the novel mm -hmm. i um it was a fun experience to kind of go back through that old stuff but yeah it's very it's it's still it's still in that kind of vein a lot all of the themes running through all of my books and this is true of everything i've got you know both parcel in the pipeline is all this is very civics focused you know it's it's this it's institutions and how they interact and the laws and rights and ethics uh, that surround those things i mean that's just the stuff i find interesting and i i like to filter it through a fantasy world or I like to filter it through a sci-fi <laughs> world and you know kind of explore the different you know aspects of it and hopefully in an interesting way because you know they can be quite dry oh, yeah. uh, topics but so you've got to make it interesting as well yeah i know uh like if you were to tell somebody like give a an elevator pitch to like the justice of kings for example it's like mm. guys it's about a lawyer but it's mm. more than that okay he can talk to the dead <laughs> and he has jedi like mind powers too okay <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> i always forget about the jedi actually the, the which is absolutely correct by the way and i think i was probably way more influenced by the star wars prequels than i realize um because they were massively important to me growing up i love the star wars prequels i'm a huge fan um and they're getting uh, respect now yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I oh it is you know what it's overdue honestly they they were over maligned I I can definitely appreciate the flaws of certainly Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones I can I can see the weaknesses in it but at the same time they were over maligned like they, they are nothing like as bad as people liked to pretend at the time um but I um I think I saw someone once maybe it was at a Reddit AMA I did a couple of years ago where they said oh you were inspired by the prequels and because uh, i saw the kind of the justices as jedi and uh mm -hmm. the empire as kind of the old republic and i thought god you know what i hadn't thought that like, <laughs> genuinely i hadn't thought of that at all but it's so true like they are like um because what what are jedi except kind of roving peacekeepers right that's ultimately and it's you know sort of the justices are with mind tricks but um the one that uh, mo is most comped is is dune the voice uh, the Bene Gesserit mm -hmm. voice um, from Dune, which is, yeah, again, fair enough. I mean, it's the same thing, ultimately. I don't remember being directly influenced in it uh, because I, um, what I, what, the way I came about those powers was I was just like spitballing in my head. What powers would a <laughs> traveling investigator want? You know, they would want, you know, what ultimately, what do we all want as as lawyers? We want a, we want a confession, you know, like just to cut through the noise. So, you know, something the power to extract a confession, the power to speak to the, you know, a, a murder victim. You know, who murdered you? Oh, it was, you know, is that guy over there? <laughs> but, you know, done. You know, so it was more thinking through the logical powers, the logical things that are. A, a legal investigator would want has powers and then of course everybody well not everybody but some people were like oh it's you know it's basically like judge dread but he's got the voice from dune and i was like yeah because if you, if you wanted to, to be reductive it definitely it definitely is like those things don't get me wrong i'm not saying it's better or above those um but uh, yeah and it's only after the book is released that all these kind of comparisons are made and so many mm -hmm. of them are just total coincidence some of them are definitely direct inspirations but some of them are just total coincidence like i remember uh petrick leo mm -hmm. the book tuber said oh it reminded me of code code gears gears code gears g-e-a-s I, I haven't even heard of that but it's a it's an anime so you know again these these ideas are perennial they have existed since fiction has existed and you know they mm -hmm. just come to us at different times <laughs> now i i see sometimes i was talking i forget which author it was but it was a couple of weeks ago where he got somebody commenting on his book saying, oh, you mm. stole this from this X, Y, Z. Right. And he's like, the author's like, I didn't even read that. So there's no way. It's so often <laughs> the case. Stole that. Mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, I don't even, um, I didn't read a lot of fantasy. I never, and I never have done. I read, probably the most fantasy I read was in my teens. Uh, but I always read more sci-fi than fantasy. And these days I just didn't read much full stop. I'm a really slow reader. Um, and so um, I, 
the likelihood of me having um, read another another author's idea is is very low. Um, I think people just <laughs> don't necessarily appreciate that there's just there's a there's a finite number of things that can happen to a given character, and of course we're mm -hmm. all writing within the framework of a storytelling mode that has that has existed for you know a century or more by now um and so necessarily you're going to be hitting those same beats you know somewhere you know not there's n nothing is original anymore um with the especially with the volume of content being driven as well mm -hmm. so i'm always untroubled by i mean i've never had an accusation in, in that vein um or at least one that has, i've not seen i mean they may they may exist but i haven't seen them um but uh, yeah the likelihood that it's i've just you know slifted something is 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 quite rare um occasionally we do you know like it was there would be like a line of dialogue or something and you think god damn it that's like the best fucking thing i've ever heard like i've got to rework that slightly i get it in somewhere like i always like to put like a line from the aliens movies in my books um oh and no then i think i, I missed that uh, yeah so um i did it in the first and second book uh second and third books i think or maybe the first as well, I can't remember. And I did run like a competition on Twitter where I say, first to find the aliens reference, it gets pretty hard back. <laughs> and day one, they always, like, they're always gone day one. Someone will get it. That's a um, Like, probably within like, minutes, somebody. Oh, oh yeah. And, and this is like a year's lead time as well, because I'll tweet it like a year before the book is even released, and people will have bookmarked the, uh, <laughs> the tweet. But the one in the book three was something like, um, Whatever happened here, we missed it. It's that bit when um, Apone is looking at the hole in the roof at Hadley's Hope Colony, which is the acid of the, the dead alien is kind of soaked through the hole and uh, the water is kind of trickling through and the Marines are moving through in the Hadley's Hope and they're like, he's like, whatever happened here, I think we missed it. And I stuck that exact line in... Um, so in book three, I was like, I've got to, I love it so much. I've got to keep just seeding <laughs> little Easter eggs. Yeah. Going back to what you're talking about, the Last War trilogy, in terms of mm. it being like five POVs, like right off the bat, mm. there was, that reminds me of a of a movie that I watched a while ago called like it's called The Vantage Point. Okay, and you would think that with the title being The Vantage Point, there mm. might be a few different vantage points, but going sure. into it, I had no idea. But it was exactly what kind of what you're describing in terms of mm. about every twenty minutes, it was a different vantage point, a different POV. Right of a singular okay. event in terms yeah, yeah. of what there's like the, what they're seeing, what they're perceiving and how, yeah. you know, to take it in. And eventually you get to the final conclusion or mm. the final arc. So, yeah, um, I, I liked the idea of one thing. So in this case, an, an alien spaceship is shot down by another alien spaceship over a human colony and it crashes into the, not into the colony, but crashes very close by. And it's, this, it's, and it becomes a huge international incident. And so it's the it, from the POV of a mech pilot and a diplomat and <laughs> the um, like the strike commander who exists, like even one of the president's kind of advisors. And so we it's overlapping. So the story is advanced in increments, and each POV deals with an aspect of it. And then you see how that POV translates into another mm -hmm. um, person's sort of POV. So you'll get multiple reruns of different aspects of the conflict as it it was fun to write um but yeah it's you know it's not gonna be everybody's cup of tea and you wrote that self-published too right so yeah when you, when you were coming into the new series or you know one that's published to orbit now mm. did you intentionally like reach out to orbit or like or were you going down the direction of self-publishing that one first or how did you wind up going down the orbit route uh so well um yeah, that's a good question. So basically, uh, I did the Honorable Trilogy. I, I wrote something else. I wrote what was going to be the first book of a new kind of military sci-fi, uh, sci-fi, science <laughs> fiction, uh, uh, se long-running series, because I love military science fiction. Um, and you know what? Just, one of the things I always, because uh, I was, you know, I was in private legal practice at the time, so I, I didn't have, I didn't have the time and energy it requires one thing you'll find with self-publishing is it requires a tremendous amount of marketing, mm -hmm. tremendous amount of marketing. And if you speak to any kind of successful uh, indie author, uh, you will learn very quickly how much time and, and money they spend on that. Um, and that, and that's, and that's not unique to the indie community. That's just what your publisher does in a, if you're trying to publish, <laughs> you're, you're just shifting the cost burden and time burden of that to them. Um, but everything requires marketing. And if you are self-publishing, you have to do that yourself. 
And um, I, I just didn't have the bandwidth for that. I didn't have the bandwidth to kind of maintain social medias and paid advertising and stuff. It was it was way because I was busy at work. Um, and so I asked the art of water Trilogy had done pretty well, actually, like, you know, with me doing nothing at all to kind of boost it. It was just kind of doing all right. Um, but that new effort, that kind of military science fiction book, it just died. It just died. Like I had a very kind of typical um, self-pub experience, which was, you know, if you just dump a book out onto the Internet and don't say <laughs> I don't tell anybody about it, you'll not sell any copies of it. Um, and uh, and I just thought, you know what, I feel like I've, I had done self-publishing for a couple of years like i'd enjoyed the experience and i enjoyed the control over the creative process that it, it had given yeah. me mm-hmm. um but uh I, I i felt like i'd kind of ultimately since my early teens you know my goal had been to be published by a big kind of sci-fi or, or um, fantasy imprint that was my life's ambition and um i so i kind of re- I, I kind of pivoted back to that goal um and I wrote the Justice of Kings, and I um, uh, so I, then I got an agent, so um, you know, literary agent, okay. and mm-hmm. it's their it's their job to pitch the book to, to editors. <laughs> so um, he took the book out. We we did a bit of editing, and then he took the book out on submission. And uh, Orbit were the, they were super keen on the book. They came back very very quickly and said, um, "That's great. Here's a ton of money to take it off the market." So we accepted that offer, and um, and you know, the rest is history. Well, that's fantastic. Cause I know yeah. like looking at some publishers, like you can submit a manuscript and you can wait a year plus sometimes to get a response. So I know that's kind of a, a dissuading factor for some people in terms of, you know, I'm going to stay that, here. I, is, I don't know if that's, is that right? I mean, it's quite rare. If your if your agent is submitting a manuscript for you, mm-hmm. I think it would be look, the internet is awash with horror stories. People love to share their horror stories, right? It's like um, my wife has two children and we've got a third on the way. And you will never hear anybody tell you a positive birth experience. Never, right? It's People only will ever share the war stories because it's more, it's more interesting. It, it's salacious. It's fun to tell. Mm-hmm. Um, and so loads of people will say, I had a terrible experience doing X, Y, Z. And very few people will say, my experience was fine, you know, with X, Y, Z. <laughs> and so I think, you know, you can get a slightly off kilter view because undoubtedly there will be people who have had bad experiences in, in, in all sorts of, however you publish a book. Um, the idea that uh, a, a, an agent would submit a manuscript and not hear back for a year or 18 months, I, I find a, a little difficult to swallow because most of these um, agents, you know, they have direct relationships with the editors are submitting to. Um, and so, you know, to be go- to be ghosted would be rare, I think, um, completely, mm-hmm. um, unless it was a mistake, you know, unless unless it just kind of slipped through the cracks. Um, to say that's not to say it never happens, but I, for that to for that to occur often enough for it to be a serious concern for for people on submission i'm not sure i i I think that's correct but happy to be proved wrong it could be that when i was exploring it it was Mm. for people that don't have an agent in terms of having that established connection because the the, the publisher i'm talking about in particular is actually bane books who is also sci-fi and fantasy and like even on their website they say 12 months you, you might hear back is that so, and, and is that their slush pile? Is it their um, unagented submissions? I'm not sure. I didn't yeah. look that far into it. All I saw was the 12 months. Yeah. So maybe uh, they maybe, so maybe Bain, could be Bain are their own. Bain are their own. They've got a, their own thing going on at the moment, mm-hmm. um, and I think they have a lot. I think they have a lot going on that I'm not really qualified to, to talk about. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, so what they ha- you know these days because of the overwhelming number of people who want to be published, and you know that's that's not changed. But I think there's across the board, across the creative board, just there is so much content being produced. It's never been easier yes. to mm-hmm. to to produce something. The tools are, are there, um, and I think because there are so many people who who want to be um, professional writers and who want to be published, um, a lot of the bigger um, publishers now will accept agented only submissions um, because the agency uh, mm-hmm. yeah, acts as a, a bit of like a quality filter almost. Um, so your agency is 
the first port of call, they kind of got their, their fingers on the pulse of the market, what the market's doing, um, and uh, you know whether the book is kind of good enough to be then passed on to publishers, or, or maybe it needs a little bit of work, and you can do that with your agent, or maybe it's a no from the agent. So it's kind of like an early filter, so that the um, commissioning editors can then accept, because they still get you know hundreds of submissions, right? But at least <laughs> at least some of some of them have been weeded out, and they're not having to spend time, you know, going through the really terrible stuff. Um, mm. And uh, one and so, but publishers used to have what they call the slush pile, which were just unsolicited manuscripts that anybody could mail in. And, and, and even when I was, um, you know, when I first started writing in my teens, Orbit had one of those, they probably don't now, um, mm -hmm. but you could just send them a book and on, on the off chance they, they could publish it. But, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, um, but I would, I would expect the lead time on that to be astronomical. Yeah, for sure, like a year easy. Yeah, because okay. um, no one will be reading them. They'll, they'll, be, getting so, they'll be getting so many books through mm -hmm. the official kind of agency pipelines that you know and just going and going through and rejecting and or accepting those <clears throat> that there's there's there'll there'll be no need to even touch the slush pile because they'll their query piles will be so full already that would be my read on on that situation no, i can definitely understand that hmm. in terms of the, the slush pile now as well especially with these ai tools coming out in terms of people being able to just yeah, you know, right. type in a prompt and then out, generate some outputs, garbage. Uh, yeah, sure. A pile of garbage that might <laughs> might be something that can string together, but it's just not. I you not know what? Work. I don't. This idea that um, because it's all grift, right? A AI is 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 just it's pure grift. It's it's not about artistry or creating mm -hmm. something interesting or uh, some commentary on the human condition. It's a it's a hack to make <laughs> passive income. Like these, it's, it's the same with like the AI reference tools that people sell on art station or whatever um it's this it's this idea that if i can create enough income streams i too can be one of these millionaires i see on instagram um and so it's this idea that if i flood kindle with mm -hmm. just shit um and get other bots to to read it i will generate kdp um, unlimited, you know, income from that stream. It's nothing to do with writing a novel or being creative. It's about making tiny increments of money from like a hundred different sources until that are kind of, it's the worst possible. Um, mm -hmm. It's the, I mean, AI is its whole own thing. And I, I don't know any author who would <laughs> touch it with a barge pole. Honestly, it's, um, it's, it's just dreadful. Uh, I, I think any, I think anything, any AI, as soon as you're introducing that into your creative process, you, you're already at, that's me. I'm out of, I'm out of, I'm out of your world now. I promise you I'll never read anything or look at anything mm -hmm. that you produce ever again. Um, it, a while ago, it, I found out that uh, there was people making AI generated YouTube content. to so where they have like a script that runs right. in terms of it runs a prompt. It grabs right. the results, puts yeah. the script into a screen, has a voiceover, like um, electronic sounding, um, like Alexa voice that talks to right. the script. And then this uploads it immediately to YouTube time and time and time again in terms of at least uh, 10 uploads an hour. Oh I found three accounts that do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, I can't even imagine how many more of these are out yeah. there. I just found oh. three of them. Yeah, it's it's I don't, it's it's and it, it'll be about ad revenue, right? It'll be about getting ads mm -hmm. on those videos, and 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 they'll have bots that are clicking because it's it's not it's not about generating something that someone's going to watch. It's about mm -hmm. it's gaming the algorithm for tiny fractions of pence, you know, in 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 revenue. Um, and you do it, you know, and if you scale it big enough, you know. A million pennies <laughs> starts to stack up <laughs> quite quickly, right? Um, but but also, I mean, it's it's just like, I mean, I mean, I've I get my social media feeds get flooded with stuff about AI now, um, or oh, about how bad it is. Um, it's it's the it's the environmental impacts more than anything else, like the server farms that are just creating this sludge for the internet and the energy they require to run. Oh Mm -hmm. you know and, and just destroy you know the carbon footprint of these things um is uh, is awful it's like why why are we 
allowing this to happen like why who wh where is the regulation like what who is benefiting from this process and there's already like a ton of articles saying ai it, it can never it will never be the models that exist at the moment the llms just by their very function will never be able to innovate so you will always get weird weirdness you know in in the output always you'll never be able to get around it no matter how refined they become because they are they are incapable of thinking they are just dumb machines replicating the next most likely sequence of words or pixels mm -hmm. um and so it's like well so what to what end you know what so what is it all for we're gonna you know decimate artistic communities and we're gonna decimate the, the atmosphere and their infrastructure and whatever and you know, ten years down the line, everyone's like, "Yeah, why? Why did we even bother with that?" And and the internet is going to become so full of of total garbage that it'll uh, be un yeah. slow and unusable. I just think you know, it's all for its own sake. It's all for it's it, there's no purpose to it, which is just a baffling thing. It's a, I I remember when AI first came out, um, and I was I I was I, I admit right. So a friend of a friend of mine introduced it to me. And I went on the, uh, this was about a year ago, maybe. And mm -hmm. they, had the disc, they had the Discord uh, for Mid Journey. And I went on it and I was like, oh, this is cool. And I like did a, um, I, I tried to do like, get it to generate a picture of Sova, you know, the capital from the Empire of the Wolf. Yeah. And uh, it, it did pretty, it did a pretty cool job. It was a bit of a weird image, but like, you know, if you sort of <laughs> zoomed into it, you've got like these little artifacts and sort of fractals and stuff. But generally it was pretty cool. And I was like, oh, wow, that's cool. Um, and I kind of saved the image and then I kind of played around with it for a day or two. And I just found, I was like, well, it's just giving me like, you know, nine times out of 10, it's just giving me something I'm not interested in looking at. Um, and you, you, you can't refine it in any meaningful way. And I just got bored of it and I stopped using it. And then, mm -hmm. and then it later transpired how those images were being generated. They were being scraped from, you know, copyrighted materials from the internet. And I became very anti AI after that. Um, but, uh, you know, but I just, I, I can't understand the kind of what possesses a person to want to spend time creating those pictures like what do you even do with them once you've created it's a bit like scrolling through instagram it's like it's like an addiction you're not you know you do it for like 10 minutes and then you just feel a bit shit and you're like oh i don't <laughs> i don't feel good having looked at 10 minutes of instagram if anything the opposite and you know so mm -hmm. but it's it's like a kind of addiction isn't it and i think it's the same with the ai these guys just kind of putting in prompts and they kind of just get addicted to the process rather than like actually enjoying the art artwork that it, it kind of generates it's not like they're printing them off and hanging them on the wall or anything it's just about like for you know i don't understand it personally i don't understand the appeal <laughs> but yeah there we go yeah that can be a that can be a whole discussion absolutely mm. and uh you know what i think we can uh we have a question right here from mr yeah. bo kelly in terms of goldsboro special editions i didn't even know you had special editions uh, I do so i don't have any of, any of this series here Special yes. editions? Yeah, they are. Yeah, they did uh, 2000 for Justice of Kings and then they. Oh. <laughs> so what happened was, it was quite frustrating, actually. So to answer your question, Bo, um, my favorite, I think, is probably, I actually really like the third one. Um, I like the uh, the wolf. I think it looks like a, it looks like a kind of heraldic crest with two wolves. I have to check my copy. I haven't looked at it much. Um, it was cool, but it was also slightly frustrating because um, they did 2,000 copies of the first book, mm -hmm. and then they all, and then they sold like a ton of them, right? In like they sold about a thousand in the first week of release, which was great. And then um, I think the second thousand took like quite a long time to all go. So when they were, were re-upping on the second book, they were like, eh, "Well, they're going to take 750 for book two. and uh, I was like, "Okay, that's frustrating," but I, I guess that makes, <laughs> that makes sense if they're not selling. That's fine. And then in the intervening period, they all went, right? So they totally oh, sold yeah. out of Justice of Kings and, and quite quickly as well. And so now 1,250 people will not be able to get the full set. You know, so uh, it, was, it was a little short-sighted, I thought. Um, but uh, hey-ho, I, I originally wanted red, yellow, and blue uh, spray edges because that's the, um, the colors of the Haugenate device, which is the Imperial device, red, yellow, blue, with the black wolf rampant in the middle. And I thought that would look very cool on the shelf. You would have like the red, yellow, blue, and then the, across all three, you would have the um, the heraldic device. That was my idea. Oh, that's sweet. Um, mm. Take my shot there. <laughs> just take it in my hands. So I was like, okay, well, you do what you want then. Um, but yeah, I think the third the third Goldsboro edition looks best. And I think the cover is spectacular as well. Um, that was... Uh, so, oh, they're different color, like different covers than these ones here? Yeah, yeah. 
Oh wow. no, sorry, no, no, no. The, sorry, the, but the but the covers of those are spectacular. There, there's no alternative oh. covers, but I mean the ones that are that have been done. I think they look great. Um, it was exactly what I wanted uh, from my from the from the style of artwork, kind of mm. what they call fantastical realism, which is a picture that's painted to look like a like a real thing. Um, so uh, I mean, I love kind of more impressionistic artwork as well. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I, I saw Martina's work. She did a little Magic the Gathering work, and um, I was like, "Yeah, that's just that's just perfect." Like I love that stuff. And she was doing uh, the Witcher special editions at the time. So for all, oh yeah, those was, are beautiful. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, she was doing the illustrations. You know, the Yennefer one, and you could see the Geralt outside, outside that castle. And there's a few kind of stunning illustrations for those. And um, so luckily for me, Lauren Panapinto, who's the art director in, New in Orbit, New York, said. Um, Ah, you know, we're having trouble finding a an art cover artist for Empire of the Wolf. Like, would you be interested? And she was, and so you know, the rest is history. So I, I, I do really love those covers. Um, uh, and I've seen so many people say the covers are incredible, or I picked up the books for the covers alone, or you know, because and they really are stunning. So I was really happy with those. Well, they they definitely are stunning. They look great mm -hmm. on the shelf. They and, do. Uh, all of them look great. I I like the second one for sure because uh, mm -hmm. that the second one is. Helena, right? Yes. Yeah, 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 for sure. Okay, I, I got think... it right. Woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's the Conrad Helena, and then um, uh, Graxes is the third one. It's the um, is the trickster. Um, I wanted to um, have a, a figure from the afterlife on the third one, and um, because of Graxes is a, uh, he's also and he has the two headed snake. So when we were, they all actually asked me. They said because um, mm -hmm. we they did the first cover, they came up with that completely, and then they asked me for a little bit of input. Second one, they asked me if I had any any ideas. Um, they said we'll, we'll go with, with Helena, we think. Um, but do you have any ideas? And I sort of had the idea of the deer-headed, you know, Nima, the deer-headed god, uh, god in the background. And everybody loves that cover. It's a fantastic cover. And actually, she won an award for it. Martina won an award for that cover. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. She was juried on a, some kind of illustrators award, and she and that one, so it was fantastic. And then for the third one, I was like, let's. It was difficult, and it's difficult to talk about spoilers because. When you read the first book, you would logically think like Bressing it would be on the third cover. Um, yes, but, uh, you know, but but of course. So yeah. um, <laughs> we had to kind of think outside the box a little bit, and there was the idea. Well, maybe we should do Claver, and um, that, you know, they said, "Who do you think?" And I was trying to think of a a character uh, because there's, there's Helena and there's Sir Conrad, but then there are kind of like some major minor characters like Sir Radomir and von Ostelin and Bressinger. Um, but they're kind of all, all three of them are kind of like equal in standing. So it would feel like, like there's no real way of, to my mind at least, kind of picking between them. Um, and so I thought, well, maybe we should have like a de like a demon. No, no, that would be cool, you know. And so they said, <laughs> well, you come cool. up with like it would be, and, and it was cool. And they said, uh, you you come up with like three or four ideas, and, and we'll see. And so I said, well, you've got because also because you've got to factor in the statue behind as well. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, let's do a grax seeds because then we can have the two headed snake statue. Um, because Graxis is a two-headed snake in, in the Neiman Pantheon. And and that will look really cool. And even though he's not like he's quite a minor character, but in, 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 irrespective of that, I think it would be um awesome to have him on the cover. Um and uh, you know, so that's the route that we went down in the end. But it's a beautiful picture. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, looking at book one, I think a lot of people might assume that von vault would be like the main pov 100 percent. but you learn right away pretty quickly I, that yeah mm. he is not the main pov we actually had yeah. elena which i think is a fantastic character but i thought it was very interesting mm. that you wrote it in this way to where you're kind of telling von vault's story through helena's mm. eyes yeah right? yeah so how, did, how did you come up with that kind of um framing there for that yeah, that you know what a lot of people ha thought that, and uh, I've seen it. Some people say, "Oh, it's wonderful." It's an, I, I think the, the the general consensus to um, having Helena as a narrator has been very positive, and most people agree that it's the best choice for the story. But occasionally, I do see you know someone will say, "Oh, I thought it was Sir Conrad," or "I wish it was Sir Conrad," or um, <laughs> you know, blah 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 blah. I actually read uh, this. So the idea, and to be fair, that 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 again, that 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 narrative frame is not a new idea. Loads of books have done it. I saw um, the book that inspired me to do it was Robert Harris's uh, Cicero trilogy, because von Vault in my mind is this, he's a statesman, he's a lawyer, he's this traveling judge, he's a, he's a kind of 
a great man of history, if you like, within the within the Soviet Empire. And it's much the same way that Cicero was. So Cicero started as a lawyer, and then he became a senator. Um, and when Robert Harris wrote his trilogy, he had Tiro, who's Cicero's slave, um, tell the story of Cicero. And I really liked I really liked that choice because what it enables you to do is. So Conrad's POV would not be an interesting POV. Um, it just, it, it genuinely, it wouldn't because he is he is so self possessed mm -hmm. and so sure of himself, and he's so competent um, that it would be it would just be a bit dull. And, and he is a kind of like a, he's a serious and a and a severe man, um, and so you know his his thoughts and his internal dialogue, I don't think would be interesting to read at all. I think it's much more interesting to read uh, someone's, one of his retainers view of him, and especially someone who is young and impressionable and exists in this very awkward place in their life where they've had a very difficult upbringing. And this is one of the, one of the criticisms I see of Helena um, is uh, she's very whiny or um, <laughs> she, she's, she's, not, she's not street smart enough. And, you know, and I, I, one thing I always say is like, that's not how difficult upbringings work. Like, you know, if you had a rough childhood, you are not a well-adjusted adult. Like this idea that like street urchins are like super tough and street smart and wise. They're not, they're broken people. You know, psychologically, they're broken and they suffer. All, I, and I know there's some personal experience, not my personal experience, but people I, people I hasten to add, people I know who have had very difficult upbringings, very abusive upbringings, they are, they are not well-adjusted adults. Um, mm -hmm. And they, one thing that you will find with people who have suffered a difficult childhood is they crave stability. Um, and so Von Volt is Helena's stability. He's her, he's her rock. And that's why she reacts so viscerally to him when he is out of sorts, you know, when things are going wrong when he mm -hmm. is not himself as he progresses down this path. So she resiles and provides a foil to him. And at the same time, she's maybe a little bit in love with him as well. You know, it's it's an unhealthy kind of power dynamic that exists between them. And I wanted to explore that unhealthy power dynamic. I wanted Von Volt to be a kind of, he's his mentor, he's his father figure, but he's, a, he's a, just a guy, you know, and Helena's young and attractive. So he kind of like maybe fancies her a little bit, but professionally he's like, no, I'm not going to mess around with my apprentice and she's young and impressionable and she's utterly dependent on him and it creates this kind of toxic codependency mutual attraction and i wanted to explore that too and i don't think a lot of people didn't really like that aspect of it but i was like well you know hey something what are you gonna do shoot me <laughs> um and so but it was about it, it, it's a book about adult themes right and i'm, I'm exploring mm -hmm. a i'm exploring a relationship between two people and so it was um it was a much better narrative decision to then have her, this girl, this young woman, um, talk about Von Volt and his impact on her and her impression of him, and also to provide a slightly less less biased view of his, you know, his journey and his character kind of evolution as well. Because obviously, like Von Volt becomes much more laissez faire with how he applies the law, and Helena mm -hmm. becomes much more rigid and stratified as a result, and. Um, and then, but because she's old, she's an old woman telling the story. Um, you can also have her provide commentary on. Well, maybe I was being a bit like you know, maybe I could have been a bit more real <laughs> politic about it. You know, maybe I was being a bit silly about it. But you know, hey ho, I was only twenty at the time. Um, and so you know, I, I think it was um, it was definitely the better uh, narrative uh, decision. And, and you know, and, and luckily, I think most people have kind of identified with that and connected with that. Well, I definitely have. I I remember, I think it was in book one, where I think his name was Matas. Or... Oh, yeah. Matt. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> People hate that. <laughs> <laughs> I see, oh, my, oh, you're right. Just, let me let me rant about this. They, <laughs> this is the, this is back to what I was just talking about. Right. So this they, you get these kind of. Um, so this is back when I used to read a lot of reviews for Justice of Kings. And then I and then I stopped after a while. I I read I, I these days I barely read anything of the Justice of Kings actually. But um, if I do, it's just the five stars. I, I and that's the same for all three books now. I just read the five star reviews. It's a wonderful little pick me up, and then I go back to work. Um, mm -hmm. Back when I was reading all of them, and there was this common thread of critique about Matas, 
and his role in the story and the insta love. <laughs> and I was like, again, it's I, I get it. I get it. I get how it read. I, I, I do understand. Like, and ultimately, when you put a book out into the world, um, there's, um, you know, it's the death of the author, right? You know, we, we, all would, we would all have to write our own reviews. We would all have people to, to fully grasp and grapple with and understand the themes that we're exploring. Absolutely. And, and that's never going to happen. And you just have to make your peace with it. And I think every author goes through that period of maybe six months and then they just fucking give up. And they're like, okay, whatever, I'm done. I can't spend any more mental energy on this. But the mass ass storyline frustrated me because I think people, uh, people who didn't like it thought it was just a kind of crowbarred in weird insta love ya romance that had no place in the novel and i was like that's that's totally missing the point of matas and, and his character matas is 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 as, as i've just said like people who have difficult upbringings they crave stability and helena is not sure whether she wants to carry on with sir conrad yeah. or not and uh, so she's very torn. She sees this guy. She's a fucking teenager. She's like 19 years old, right? Teenagers fall in love with the drop of a hat. I certainly did. <laughs> um, and uh, she sees this guy. She, she, she fancies him a bit. He's, a, he's an attractive guy. He obviously likes her. She's a good looking girl. Um, and they just have a bit of a, you know, just have a thing going on, right? And the whole point of it was like, as Von Vault becomes a bit more less, a bit less stable, a bit more antsy, a bit more aggravated with the, the goings on in Galen's Vale, she begins to kind of withdraw in on herself again. It's, like, it's all about this kind of back, harking, harkening back to her difficult childhood. She was an orphan. She was a ward of the state. And she is latching on to the possibility of a very stable, very kind of mm -hmm. straight line um, life. And so she's like, Matters and matters provide. He represents that. He's just a simple guy in a in a smallish town. Uh, they they get on and um, you know and I think she has. I think she must sleep with him in the first book. I can't remember now. Um, <laughs> and they get together, but but at the same time, she is utterly enthralled by von Volt as well. She's mm -hmm. she's drawn to him. She he's like a magnetic force, and so she's very torn between the two. And that was the purpose of the character of Matas was to kind of provide that internal um uh you know uh conflict between uh, you know, within helena and of course <laughs> but of course your people were just like oh it was just insta love romance blah, blah, blah. And I was like, it, it isn't that like or it certainly wasn't intended to be that you know there was there was some thought that went behind it but you know it, it didn't land for a lot of people and even in the good reviews you know it was the one thing people singled out as like well, I don't, <laughs> the book didn't need that and i was like the book doesn't need anything like the book <laughs> like I, the book will be what i decide to write it as it, there's, there's no formula about what can and can't go into a book i actually i personally love a bit of romance in all my books um and peter hamilton did it very well he's a sci british sci-fi author he's very huge he's one of the best-selling sci-fi authors in the uk um and i read loads of his books growing up and he always had silly you know salacious he had like you know the, the galaxy is ending and oh, we're fighting in spaceships, but he always made time for the to, you know the people going and they're fucking each other and they're falling in love and they're having messy kind of relationships. And I love that stuff. Like that's like the human interest part of the story. You know, it's mm -hmm. what makes us people. And I think people who uh, I don't like it when people say I don't like romance in my books. I don't like to read. It. I just want. And it's a surprisingly common. Um, uh, view and people will lampoon your romances or they will say oh you know it was silly it was unrealistic whatever but I'm a, i was a little bit i was a little bit ups not upset is the wrong word but i was i was it was a shame that it didn't i think some people got it and occasionally i'll see a review where someone has fully grappled with matas and the purpose of matas and you know what narrative purpose he served and i'm like thank you i'm not going mad like some people did get that but i think for a lot of people they just thought it is this fucking guy like you know, <laughs> get him out get him out of it i want to hear about the investigation like dude, i don't want to do this and i'm always like i'm telling the story it's not like there's no um it's not like this is broader canvas that i'm pulling the story from and curating a little plot like everything that's on the page is what i've made up you know it's, it's not like i'm kind of filtering it from a bigger story and, the, and i'm denying them the kind of broader <laughs> plot you know um so anyway, sorry, I don't know what you were going to ask, but that was my, that was my thoughts. No, that. I think uh, you're going down the direction that I was thinking anyways, but I was actually yeah, thinking yeah. about how um, when Hel Hel Helena was telling, mm. I might have this wrong in my mind. I remember, okay. I think I remember Helena mm. telling Von Vault that she wants to stay with Matas. Yes. And then Von Vault says, that's fine. If that's what you want to do. I yeah. thought that was really interesting that there wasn't like a, um, 
uh, like a peer pressure from Von Vault. No, you have to say if me, he was giving her an option. And I like yes. how eventually she, she made a choice of because you know, yeah. events happen. But yeah. I just thought that was so interesting that, uh, yeah, no, thanks, yeah. like, you know what? Okay. Yeah. You, if you want to be a femme, then do it. Yeah. I think of the point that, the, and that's, I'm glad you picked up on that. I think, you know, ultimately, Von, look, we've got work to do. It's a difficult life. I'm not going to lie. You know, we get well paid, but we don't get much time to kind of enjoy that money or do anything with it. We enjoy, you know, unlimited power, but, um, you know, we're agents of the state, um, you know, we're hated and loved in equal measure. You know, it's it's not a life for everybody. And I don't want someone working for me who isn't 100% mm -hmm. in, you know, and you can only reach that decision yourself. I can't make the decision for you. Uh, it's like sometimes you'll have, um, you know, when you're working in an office or whatever, and and uh, someone will be doing a crap job. And you just, you know, do you want to be here? Like, you know, if you don't want to be here, go, like, you're, this is not a prison. No yeah. one's holding a gun to your head. And you know, this is a law firm, you know, you've got to work hard. And you just, and it's like, you've got to want it. Because if you don't want it, um, life will be you know, miserable. Thanks, Caden. Thanks, mate. Um, life will just be miserable for everybody. You know, you'll do a bad job. You'll do a bad job for me. And I need people, you know, the island of work is very important. So, yeah, it was, I think it was very in, in keeping with <laughs> Von Volt's character at that point in the trilogy, for sure. And I think maybe in book three, he would probably have been much more like you just said, um, you know, no, Helena, I need you. I need you badly. You know, you have to Ooh, stay. Here we um, go. Not in a not in a sec not in a sexual way. I mean, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> well, maybe he does, you know, but yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, he, he they become much more codependent as the, as the trilogy progresses, and um, and Helena becomes much more important in and of herself. Um, now, with us getting a little bit close now to mm. the end of this thing, yeah, I just want to ask you something that's been uh, kind of brewing here lately sure. on the the Twitter world of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, what do you think about prologues? <laughs> oh my god do you, you skip know prologues <laughs> I, I don't i and i very ill-advisedly as well yesterday i know i always avoid the book drama or if i if i engage with it i do it in a kind of jokey way um because it's all so stupid you know mm -hmm. all of it is, is so stupid <laughs> um and it's just a load of people shouting over each other trying to score worthless points you know and getting very stressed out about about no, about nothing. It's it's and that's the thing. It's it's anyway. Yesterday I t I tweeted something like and I, it was half it was half in jest, and it was half you know sort of true. And I said something like, I'm sure people are just getting a preface and a prologue confused now because I can't fathom I can't fathom skipping a prologue. It it, it is so strange to me. Like and and I say this to someone who you know so someone will say I read the last page of the book first so I know how it ends, and although I think that's a ridiculous way of engaging with a novel <laughs> at the same time i can i understand i understand the compulsion i understand why if you found books stressful you love reading books but you find fantasy novels stressful to read you might want to know how it ends and then at least take some of the press it's a kind of like so very okay very occasionally I'm, I'm watching something and it's stressing me out. i don't really like watching stressful tv right but i'm watching something stressful and i'll just look at the wikipedia we can be like, I'm like, how does this end? Just how obsessed do I need to be? This is too much. And so I understand that sort of thing, right? Even though I would never do it, I understand it. But I, but the, with the prologue thing, I just can't understand it. And, and I, I think, I think it comes down to two things. I think it's mainly, may, maybe because I'm not, I'm not really widely read, right? And I'm sure there are people who read hundreds of books a year. Okay, I, I, and I just, I just don't. I can't read that many books. And so maybe it's quite common. And I just don't know for a prologue to be somehow divorced from the rest of the narrative in a, in, in a way that makes it utterly valueless. Um, mm -hmm. But then I question why it was included in, in the first place. I mean, the, so it's a it's a weird one. So maybe so maybe that's part of it. And there are just so many. But I've I've I just. I've never not in, picked up a book and just started with a. I usually skip if there's a if there is a preface or an introduction. I always skip those, um, yeah. because but the actual narrative, that's like you're just skipping the first ten or so pages of the narrative. And also my prologues, I like I use them as um, thematic prologues, especially in the third book. Mm -hmm. A prologue is often temporally removed from the main story, but it sets up an important theme or point. 
and the thing, especially in Trials of Empire, the prologue really, is actually a really important part of the book. In fact, you should pay really close attention to the prologue um, because that is the, that's the, if you'll see what I'm doing with it. When you get to the book, you'll be like, I'm going to ah, go back. I got to read it yeah, again. You should. You should, because <laughs> there's a there's a message there. Uh, it's not that subtle, um, but uh, but it's there. And so if you skipped that, God knows why you would, but if you skipped it, you would miss out on one of the kind of th- key kind of climactic, thematic climaxes of, of the novel. So I find it really weird, um, to be honest, and I, don't, I genuinely don't understand it. Um, I don't understand uh, engaging with the, with the book that way. Um, you know, at worst, you might skim read it, you know, if you, if you thought, but to, but to skip it entirely, it seems like a really weird thing to do. Mm-hmm. So I, anyway, I, I, I tweeted something. It was a silly tweet. And people, and then about, <laughs> God knows, about uh, two or three hours later, the angry people found me. And uh, I was getting messages in there. And I was like, all our authors, all I've seen is authors screaming bile and, and invective at readers. And I was like, oh my good, what have I stepped into here? <laughs> So I, I just I just muted it. I was like, oh, you know what? You can argue amongst yourself. Um, but that was my that was on me. That was my fault. I shouldn't have engaged with it. And I thought, you know what? Logging off is free, guys. You know, this is not good for anybody's spleen. Um, so I find it really weird. Yeah, I don't understand it. Um, and and if you skip my prologues, you are uh, you're you're skipping an, an important mm-hmm. chunk of the of the book uh, and so i wouldn't recommend it but i mean you can if you like as long as you've bought once you've bought it i don't give a fuck <laughs> <laughs> yeah. either way i don't understand it it's like no. uh going to a movie and just fast forwarding 10 minutes and saying you know what? i'm gonna yeah. start here it is it's exactly the, it's, it's like skipping the first kind of you know that got that kind of uh bit at the beginning of the uh, fellowship of the ring where it just kind of lays all the groundwork for the it's like starting at the title screen of Fellowship of the Ring and skipping Galadriel's. Um... <laughs> <laughs> you are dead to me. Um, it's like skipping Galadriel's monologue, which is a wonderful part of the movie, um, mm-hmm. and just going in cold. I mean, it's just, it's just. I just find it weird. I, it, as distinct from other weird reading habits, which which I can at least understand. This one I find weird, and I don't understand it. Um, but hey, you know, people want to read books in that way. Who am I to tell them otherwise? Well, I know we're here at the end of the hour, and before I kind of leave it off to you with any last closing statements, if you have any, I just wanted to say again, thank you so much for joining me tonight. I've had a blast of fun. I'm enjoying myself deeply right now in the third book of the Empire of the Wolf series, and Mm. I'm excited for the special announcement I think you're going to make on this the, the oh, war. The, the sci-fi art of war. Yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah, that's, there's something coming. With, yeah, something. There is something exciting coming with that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm looking forward to all that. Yeah, thank you so much nice. for being here. Do you pleasure. have anything? Any last statements you want to say to anyone watching yeah, last, up to this point? No, I was going to pretend to do a rant about matters, but I won't. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm all good. Thank you so much. I'm going to go and lie down. Um, thanks for having me. I've had a really nice time. Uh, just chewing your ear off about things that annoy me um it, it may not be where you saw the interview going but it's where it's gone so it's going to deal with that <laughs> matas ai doom yeah. yeah good discussion that's it we hit the, <laughs> we hit the, we hit the key notes awesome nice well day. i appreciate your time thank you guys thank you. so much for joining in have a good one <laughs> and peace <laughs> see you guys thank you